um, just looking at some of the stuff that you're kind of uh, working through, right? You just the history, you're kind of thinking about the and 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 stories that our ancestors and grandfathers um, and their dinner told, um, that um, it's interesting, when you think, if you think about uh, when that strait flooded and the sea levels rose, just imagine that. When the stories before that may have been different, certainly the stories after that, mm -hmm. when the sea level reached its present level, and people said, where did it come from, grandfather? He wouldn't have said, became the world, look, we know that you know, some people do walk on water, but we didn't walk out the water, and we didn't walk on the water. So the stories went up into the sky, and that's where we spent, you can see, the time around the campfire, looking at an incredible Milky Way. Um, so the Milky Way is part of our creation, and, and uh, it tells of two ancestral beings that walked from Orion's belt, or west east of Orion's belt, down across the Milky Way, and the masses of water from those ancestral rivers, and that they came down here and they created the mountains and they cut the rivers with their stone tools, they made the animals and the plants and the people. So we are, and so that's why we look at country and sky as being one, and we also look at country as being created rather than natural. So there's a creation out there that the ancestral beings were involved in that's part of coming into their stories. Yes, I certainly made reference when you were talking about <coughs> through the buildings at one point there where the sky makes the land as well as it's kind of yes. connecting us and doing before it Absolutely. So, so I always think about that as the, the territorial marker between the, um, the Stony Creek people, this side of that where the sky makes the big mountains, and the other side. So it's, it's a way of looking at the landscape um, that absolutely it tells us what the boundaries are. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah, I think it's quite beautiful. I don't want to judge it as well, but I mean, just that idea of kind of knowing boundaries through the landscape, through the natural kind of features as opposed to different fences and demarcations that way. Mm -hmm. you know, understanding those cultures and interconnecting us. Yeah, I think it's looking at the fences that came after the square fences. Mm -hmm. Thank you. 
freeze or no, but I don't quite, I prefer to make it with fresh milk, so I will use frozen milk if I have to. So when I go to the if there's an abundance, I'll take it just when I need to do the freezer. Mm -hmm. Others? Sorry. Well, to add to that, I think there's a responsibility of artists to actually uh, interpret perhaps even be visionary about what climate change is going to mean. And I think artists will be, you know, can probably do more. I know, let me give you an example about getting land back in the early days. Uh, one of our elders went into the home house and she sat under Joan Brown, sat and she strung a, 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 a string of shells in front of all the politicians. And it was by Hudson. The return of land, those 12 parts of the land, just went like that. I just wonder about putting it on to artists to start being more creative, to tell that story about where we're going to. Because I think, you know, it's a powerful tool, is the power of art. Mm -hmm. And uh, I think, you know, I'm concerned about our planet, I'm concerned about our products and our precious landscapes. Um, and perhaps this is an opportunity for us in trying to take up that challenge. You know, as, as, as a scientist, I've been, uh, as part of what we've been working together with artists as well, it's been a great opportunity to talk about the work that our students are doing on climate change modelling and looking at some predictions of climate change and how that may affect different species across mm -hmm. the landscape. And we're seeing sort of the white gums in the Tamar Valley sort of dying at the moment and some of the predictions that are coming out of the models are showing that the white gums may not be suitable in this area into the future. So there's you know, all that kind of sort of information coming out through science that we're sort of now trying to integrate into sort of creative output as well to try and um, get some sort of message about climate change from the information across, but in a, in a sort of creative and um, sort of, yeah, way that people relate to, I suppose, rather than our scientists sort of talking all out. And I think that that's, that's really interesting. I think we'll have an opportunity to talk in more detail in that part of the commentary. Yeah. More, yeah. more about that. And I think, but I, I do think that that the one I think that's just saying that in terms of um, the role of artists in highlighting um, issues of concern and and art generally as a as a tool for for changing perceptions and um, I guess opening people's eyes to what's actually going on is a really important aspect of all these artists to um, so yeah. But, but, okay. <laughs> Um, I, I was really intrigued by um, sort of the way in which language also gets very varying in the, way, um, in the work and the way you were talking about. I'm interested um, from that lovely experience of being welcomed to country in the language of the country. I think that was really powerful opening like, for this event. And I'm interested in kind of the way in which that language and reclaiming and bringing the language back into use in its country is a way of not just kind of retain the history, but also does it change the way in which you relate to country in the way that you can name it and talk about it, and then with Vicky's work, sort of bringing that as part of your, um, the cultural practice of making. Um, let me just give you an example of how powerful and nuanced language is in terms of landscape and landscape. The, the South is group has three names. It has a name as it comes out of the Ben Lomond Ranges. It has a name as it winds around near Perth and, and Axton, and it has a name as it comes through the Cataract Gorge, which is the Pipitumala. So you can't call that whole river Pipitumala because it has got three names. Mm -hmm. I'm really worried about, okay, that's my stance with language. Mm -hmm. I am a researcher, I, I understand the nuance of language. So I just wanted to, do, I wanted to, do, to Divide myself from what's happening with the Tasmanian Aboriginal Centre and its control and development of their language, right? Because they're doing that. I do, I use the language of the ancestors that shows that wonderful uh, connection to, to how the rivers run and where they come from and how big they are and how fast they are. And then you come through that bit of cataract gorge into the Tama River, which has two names. So the Taylor River has a name from its headwaters to where the salt water meets the fresh, which is the Kahanaluka Cup. It's got a nuance of Kaka, not anyway, I'm going to be pretty cool. It's all right. I'm allowed to be. And
And then it goes from fresh water mixed with salt water to the ocean. It's called the Pomeroy. It has two names, mm. so you can't call it one. So in our work, I think there's the convexity of culture mm. that we have to try and, uh, you know, try and visualise and, and um, put into the creation of that work and then to explain it to people as to how complex our culture is. I think that's part of the work Vic was saying about um, trying to get that message, sorry, mm. about, the, about the armour and the, uh, and the loss of land when we came back. When our people came back from war, they couldn't even go into the RSL. They weren't accepted. But they weren't accepted. Mm -hmm. Oh, Uncle Kenny went to his grave. And three times he tried to get land to, from the soldier settlement uh, thing. And, and so some of our work is so political. Mm -hmm. With little beings. Mm -hmm. um, Not one Aboriginal person was given land back. Mm -hmm. And the residential is yeah. Mm -hmm. So I see that as powerful too. But mm -hmm. yeah, big uses language, I'm sure it's our own language. <laughs> <laughs> but it's also, I think it's interesting to think of language as calling us to be attentive to the nuances of the land, as we were talking about. Um, last night I was reading the, um, Robert McClellan finds that, so he's talking about um, the British Isles and the kind of the nuances of um, uh, labelling place and, and talked about again how these kind of a single word can't capture. Mm -hmm. A, a place or a, a river or a, a, you know, a particularly fleeting phenomenon of how you know, the frost settles on the land. And, um, and he's sort of talking about here's all these other kind of words that belong to particular areas in particular time. And uh, reading that, you know, I'm just like, wow, it's, it's a fascinating book, it's a bestseller worldwide. Yeah. And then when we thread that through the kind of materials that come from the land, Again, it's something that's really accessible, but you know, we can all look at you know, the images of the flag iris and think not only can we recognise the name for it, but we can also agree to mind what it looks like, what it feels like as you brush your hands through it. So it becomes this incredibly immediate and body sensation. And it's lovely. Yeah, it's really interesting that you both will work that kind of sense of the body in relation to the materials is so interesting. Absolutely. Um, but I think that there's lots of interesting connections that actually reflect on, on other things that are happening internationally at the moment. I think there is a, in, in many parts of the world, not just in Tasmania, although what we're talking about here is Tasmanian place and form, you know, that works within the context of, of a global, uh, an increasing global responsiveness to the idea of place, of being in place. And I think that that's what we're all searching for, in some sense, is a connection to where we are, mm -hmm. and a deeper, a deeper sense of, of being connected to place. Um, what we have, what we have in Tasmania, is this amazing depth of history that's here, that's been here all along. I think we have an incredibly um, difficult and and brutal colonial history that has separated us from that history and that has also, I think for many of us that are not part of the Aboriginal community, maybe that um, continues to separate us because of a sense of um, not knowing how to respond to that, a sense of shame, a sense of we wish that that could be different. Um, and I think I think that, that we we as a community are going through a time of trying to respectfully honour that history and, and also to understand that history. And I think that's the opportunity we have here, um, having been here and only passing with us, to to learn a bit more about that history, to 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 understand some of those things. And I guess in our practice, to to help to, to open that history up a little bit and acknowledge and, and honour that, um, and respectfully honour the fact that we live in a place that has this amazing deep history, you know? Like, we, we live in a place that has the oldest living culture in the world, you know? It's been, a, it's been a living, it continues to be a living culture now, you know? So it's an incredibly amazing place that we live in, you know? And, and the idea of places, place has been something with a shared understanding of 
shared histories, shared stories. The stories here go so deep that they enter the sky. So they, they sort of like, they, they, they weave the whole thing together. And that's, that's I know from my experience of having strong connections with, with the Aboriginal community, particularly through it, through through the Kiani perhaps is that, that, that you know like those connections make you feel very very rooted in place. You actually you and I and I know that as like in other indigenous cultures that sense of belonging that comes out of that really clear connection with place is something that I think that we all can have some access to. It'll be a different story for us that don't have that as long way. But we still live in the place that has that place and we can celebrate. And I guess we're looking for ways that we can do that, respectfully. Yeah, and I just think, yeah. you know, um, with great respect to parks, mm. I, I, it's really difficult sometimes when, you know, there are boundaries mm. set because of certain aspects of, you know, I wanted to go over and hang around and do some weeding with Snobby Island, and then realise, oh, you can't take, you know, foreign materials over there. <coughs> um, so there are some boundaries that we have to respect as well. So you know, there's a two-way thing. And but before we finish, I just want to say how you know, remarkable it is for his work. You know, I haven't seen a lot of work recently because you go off and do things in other places. But I have to tell you, I'm so proud of your work. And thank you so much for being so creative. It makes my heart sing to see the beautiful